it's really important to understand who is going to be affected by the impact on the ruble. The vast majority of Russians have almost no savings. Um, Russia is an incredibly unequal country. About 500 people, the, the circle around Vladimir Putin, essentially own everything. They have more wealth than the bottom 99.8% of the population. And about half, slightly more than half of their wealth, so slightly more than half of all of Russia's wealth, is held not in Russia, but offshore. I'm delighted to be joined by Oliver Bullo, the best-selling author of Moneyland and Butler to the World, How Britain Became the Servant of Tycoons, Tax Dodgers, Kleptocrats and Criminals, um, which will be out in March. Oliver, you're also an investigative journalist and you've written extensively about the former Soviet Union um, and as we'll be talking about, about illicit money um, in the UK and elsewhere. So kind of the, the perfect person to speak to for this political moment. Can we just begin? I, I want to talk to you more about, about your book and the bigger themes in it, but can we begin um, this morning? We're recording on Monday morning. Um, the ruble has lost more than 30% of its value against the dollar, which is a record low. Um, and we're seeing the impact of the sanctions imposed by the UK and the US and the EU starting to take effect. From what I gather, you've been quite critical about the extent of these sanctions and whether they will actually do much good um, in curtailing Russian influence. What do you make of, of the latest developments? Is this sort of is this enough? Well, what we've seen so far has been extraordinary. Um, if you look at what has happened in the last week in terms of sanctions already, I mean, as you say, I am a bit critical of them, and, and I'll get to that. But what we've seen. In the, in the last week has essentially undone all of the signature achievements of Putin's time in power. You know, I first moved to Russia in 1999. People used dollars because the ruble was so weak. You know, there were no big foreign investors in Russia because no one trusted the Russian law enforcement system and so on. Uh, all of these gradual making the ruble, a, as it were, a proper currency, a reliable currency, bringing in investors like BP and so on, all of that has just gone in a week. Mm -hmm. Russia has been turned into a pariah in ways that are astonishing. And the impact on the ruble is devastating. But it's really important to understand who is going to be affected by the impact on the ruble. The vast majority of Russians have almost no savings. Um, Russia is an incredibly unequal country. There's a sort of, I don't know, a, I think a misapprehension that Russia is still sort of the Soviet Union and that, you know, people are still relatively equal that is so far from the case it, it russia makes you know america look like denmark about 500 people the, the circle around vladimir putin essentially own everything they have more wealth than the bottom 99.8 percent of the population and about half slightly more than half of their wealth so slightly more than half of all of russia's wealth is held not in russia but offshore it is held in places like London, the south of France, places where they own big yachts, uh, big houses, fine art, you know, football teams, all the things that we know that Russian oligarchs like to own. So though the sanctions are important in harming the Russian economy, in fact, mm -hmm. you know, the Russian oligarchs, their assets are held in dollars or in pounds or in euros. So they're not worried about what's happening to the ruble. In fact, after this crisis is over, they'll be able to go back home and buy all the things that they haven't been able to buy so far. So what I would love to have to see, and I'm hopeful that we still will see, is sanctions against the particular people around Putin who've become incredibly rich during his time in power and against their family members whose names are often used as a sort of living shell company to hide their assets behind. That, I think, would be the kind of thing that would really change the Russian elite's calculations. If we can go after their yachts and their mansions, their fine art, their children in private schools and so on, then that would really start to shake the calculation on which the entire Kremlin regime has been based. It's just, it's fascinating. And, and, and so your, your book is perfectly timed. I, I bet your publishers are delighted. You've been, you've done this analysis, Butler to the World. It's this really compelling analysis of um, the role that Britain has has played basically since the 1950s, given how bedded in Russian money is to the UK and the position that Britain has assumed in this global system, won't this necessitate a, just a, a complete U-turn in terms of UK's relationship to Russian money? And, and do you think it's likely that, that a U-turn like that would take place? 
You're absolutely right. I mean, the, the story I tell in the book is basically the story of how Britain went from being an empire, you know, as it were, the biggest bully on the block, right? Britain was the richest, the most powerful country in the world at one point to being what we are now, which is the place where oligarchs come to launder their money, to hide their wealth. And, and I think that, I mean, that's a transformation which is so astonishing that it's almost easy to overlook, you know, how we went from one state of affairs to the other state of affairs. But that was a story that I really wanted to tell because, you know, I've been writing about Russia and the former Soviet Union for 20 years. And every time there's a major financial crime, a major economic issue, money laundering, you name it, there is always a British role in it, always, invariably. And this isn't just a Russian problem. We see it in Ukraine, Azerbaijan, Nigeria, Angola, you name it, there is always a British role. So how did that happen? And it's there's this astonishing moment in the 1950s when, and incredibly, the Russians were involved too, when essentially the Russians were worried that if there was an international crisis and their dollars were held in the United States, that the Americans would seize them. So they were looking for somewhere else to put their dollars. It's ironic considering what's been happening right now, but that was this is how it began. And those dollars were looking for a home and they brought them to London and, and banked them in London where they found a willing co-conspirator, if you will, that wasn't really illegal what they were doing, um, in the, the, the Midland Bank, um, the now defunct bank, but what used to be a, a British high street bank, who needed currency because they were short on currency reserves. So essentially, the Russians said, we have this money, we need to keep it somewhere. And the Midland Bank said, oh, thanks very much, we need money to keep. So that we, we did this deal, essentially, with the Soviet Union, they would, we would look after their dollars. And these dollars became the seed capital that, that created the most consequential British invention of the last 100 years, bar none, which is offshore finance. These This is the beginning of offshore finance as a phenomenon. And um, essentially, what it was, was London bankers realized that if they used dollars, not pounds in London, there were no rules, right? American rules didn't apply here. We're in Britain. The Bank of England didn't care. They only regulated pounds. So they'd created this regulation free space in the heart of Europe that no one else could affect. And from that space, they undermined the entire global financial system at the time. At the time, and this is also quite hard to believe and imagine, there was really strong democratic control over capital in the West, even in America. You know, there were restrictions on the interest rates banks could charge. There are restrictions on how money could move between countries, all with the aim to make sure that there was no repeat of this kind of the, the stock market crash of, of the 1920s, which led to the Great Depression and therefore for the rise of fascism. It was this determination to have democratic control over money that London destroyed. And then the problem is, as long as there's one space where there's no limits on capital, then all the other countries had to sort of deregulate to catch up in order to prevent their entire financial system moving to Britain, which is what happened first in America, and then in Europe, and then everywhere. So offshore capital conquered the world because of London. And this takes mm -hmm. us back to, to what happened in Russia and what the, what the Kremlin has been doing. You know, oligarchs are very good at some things, right? They're very good at killing people. They're very good at stealing companies, rigging court proceedings, invading sovereign nations. But none of these things are useful when it comes to integrating into the global economy. So after 1991, when the oligarchs essentially stole Russia from the Russian people in these various rigged privatization auctions. They needed someone to ease their passage into the international financial system, to help them raise money on capital markets, to hide their money offshore, all that. They needed someone with matching skills. They had the rough skills. They needed someone with the smooth skills. And that was where they found London. And it is the most astonishing example of how Britain became butler to the world's oligarchs. Because, you know, previously we were the oligarchs, right? That's what being an empire was. But you know, we stopped being that, we couldn't afford to be that anymore, but we still knew how to do it. So we could use that knowledge that we'd previously used on our own account and sell it to other people. And that's what we did for the Kremlin and its oligarchs. That's what we've done for, 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 for crooks and thugs from all over the world. And what we're seeing now with what's happening in Ukraine is, is the wages of that behavior. If you embolden oligarchs, mobsters, essentially, mafiosi who run a country, then this is what you end up with, you know, and, and we have been the mob bankers for too long. And yes, as you asked, will it be possible to wean ourselves from that role? Well, it's going to be very difficult. A lot of people make a lot of money out of this role. And the, you know, the government has an, announced some measures to bring transparency to our economy and to our property sector, which is great. All of those things are long overdue. They've been promising them for years. And hopefully they will now finally come into being. But we already had very good laws against money laundering and financial crime. The problem is they weren't enforced. 
And the reason for that is that the National Crime Agency, the Serious Fraud Office, the various police agencies just didn't have the resources they needed to enforce these laws. And what I'm very worried about is that, you know, the attention of the world will move on. Hopefully the Ukraine crisis will soon be over and Ukrainians can go back to living in peace and freedom. After that has happened, it is imperative that we don't let the government just carry on as before and not give law enforcement the resources they need to fight the oligarchs. Because you can't fight oligarchs on the cheap. They they hire the best lawyers. They hire absolutely the best accountants. They hide their money in ways that no one else can afford to do so. And unpicking those networks requires effort and resources and time. And above all, it requires the political will to do it. So I'm yet to see any sign that this government understands what is really required in order to fight this, you know, frankly, serious threats to democracy and stability. I think it's um, it's it's great that we're that we're talking about this right now, because I suppose it, it feels like we this is a, a rare political moment where the space has opened up to really talk about this because you've been working on it for a while. But I think, as you kind of alluded to there, there hasn't been as much interest. And then suddenly with the crisis in Ukraine, we're, we're taking stock of Britain's relationship to Russian money and its relationship to oligarchs. I'm just wondering if you could sort of go in in a bit more detail, tell us a bit more about the lay of the land currently. Have you sort of explained how we got here? But looking at the British establishment right now, Britain's, you know, current relationships to money, you know, various people, people can think of individuals, um, what it looks like right now and what would be required to unpick that. Yes, one can think of individuals. One also has to be careful, perhaps not to mention the individuals. They remain um, mm. uh, very well lawyered up. What we need to understand is that essentially the more dubious a transaction is, the higher the fees that can be earned for undertaking that transaction. London's role has been since the 1950s that the business that is too dodgy to take place on Wall Street takes place in London. And so an entire class of people in the city has grown up who earn their living and earn a very good living from doing the deals that are too dodgy for Wall Street. And this, I mean, this isn't just a question of working for kleptocrats. We saw in the last financial crisis, 2007-8, that all the, the dodgiest trades that, that brought down the global financial system were done in London. You know, we see it with big money laundering scandals out of out of Russia or out of wherever, out of, you know, Mexico with the with the drug cartels, again, run out of London. So, you know, what does it really look like? What it looks like is a is a political class that is totally wedded with our financial elite, the elite of, of the City of London and the elite of you know Mayfair where the hedge funds are. They're the same people. You know, I mean, if you look at the people who, who who make up the government, you don't need to go far beyond the very first ranking members of the government to see the people who have made their living and made their career in that business. And anyone who works in a particular business can persuade themselves that what they're doing is not harmful. Because if you are essentially reliant financially on a particular trade, you're always going to find a way to justify it to yourself. For the record, this is not an anti-Tory thing. This is something that was a big problem under the previous government as well. Tony Blair was just as willing to to, to embrace Vladimir Putin as David Cameron was, and, and so on. What we really need is, is, a, is far more pressure from outside to represent the viewpoints of ordinary Ukrainians or ordinary Russians who don't get a vote in this country. Because the issue is that all of the benefit to the butler business accrues at the top, right? It's either accrues to the oligarchs or it accrues to their enablers, to us, to the butlers. And all the victims, the harm that this causes, it's all elsewhere. It's in Ukraine or elsewhere in Eastern Europe or, or, in, or in, in Nigeria, or Angola, Egypt, Malaysia. It's wherever. It's not here. And so what we really need is for people in this country to to understand the harm that this policy is causing around the world and to make sure that that harm and the victims are, are, are represented, their voices are heard in this country. Because, you know, as it stands for, for, the, for the longest time, it has been very easy for governments to essentially prioritise the fees earned in the City of London over the harm that the City of London's activities cause elsewhere. And you, I mean, you, your focus has been on on the city, um, there. But I suppose it it has a knock on effect into other things. I mean, there's a fascinating 
bit in your book about the impact that it has on the legal profession, that actually barristers in London can earn such high fees from representing oligarchs, for example, that they're disincentivized from taking on less well-paid roles as judges. And and that has a sort of damaging knock-on effect on the legal system. It's right. It, it's, an, it's a remarkable um, example of the corrupting and distorting effect of these huge quantities of money. You know, there are now common law tribunals operating with British judges and lawyers in in the UAE. Uh, there's another one in, in Kazakhstan. Um, there's a suggestion that one could be created in Uzbekistan. And these are places that are essentially like a little island of British law, English law particularly, in an autocracy where if you are wealthy enough to bring a, dis- a, debu- a dispute, you can take it there and have your case resolved by uncorruptible British lawyers and British judges, and that's all going to be fine. And then you can go back out to the autocracy and impose your will using the local courts. You know, And so, yes, that obviously changes the calculations of, of barristers. They're rational people. They, they can say, well, I can earn a fortune if I go and do this work. Why would I you know, do legal aid work? Why would I become a judge? Why would I work on you know, helping poor immigrants when I can help rich immigrants. And that is just an example of the distorting effect that this butler to the world business model has had on the whole country. Because, um, you know, I I mean, I'm sure many of the people listening to this can remember when they were at university and you used to get these careers fairs and, you know, and the milk round, like it's called sometimes, you know, where big law firms, big accountancy firms, big financial institutions would come and pitch their businesses to to the graduates or to the soon to be graduates and and what they could offer was money lots of money you know starting salaries which were which were really quite generous and that is very distorting into what the brightest people go into they don't go into you know building things solving problems they go into you know what's called financial innovation euphemistically which isn't really innovation in any meaningful sense it's just coming up with new clever ways to get around the law and that is distorts the entire business model of the whole country And that's why I think this Butler business model has been so harmful in a way, because all the things that these incredibly bright people could be doing, they're not doing. Instead, they're just moving money around for other rich people. How significant do you think that the the role of soft power plays in, in this? So not just the financial role of the City of London, but the sort of the wider place of the UK in sanitizing the reputations of particular people. I think, you know, you mentioned educating oligarchs' children at some of, you know, the Britain's elite schools, things like that. Beyond the the narrow financial stuff, um, how significant is the wider role that the UK plays um, on the softer it, side? That That's a really important point and one that doesn't get nearly enough attention. You know, Britain's reputation around the world, you know, is the country of Harry Potter, and uh, James Bond. It's a place with this substantial reputation for cultural, you know, excellence, really. And that is part of the reason why we as a country have been so good with this butler business model, because, you know, we have a readily exportable international brand. One thing I I wrote and researched this book to a large extent um, during 2020. So obviously, I wasn't able to travel um, because none of us were. There were a couple of trips I managed to get in. I, I went to the British Virgin Islands and Gibraltar beforehand, which really um, were really important, informing aspects of the book. But one trip I really wanted to make <laughs> was to Egypt, partly because the birth of offshore finance and the real sort of death moment of the old city of London and the birth of the new city of London was the Suez crisis, when you know the financial markets really froze up for Britain, slightly in the way that they have for Russia at the moment. Um, and the sort of dollar market was born and the pound market died. But also because, and this fascinates me, you know, Egypt, the Suez crisis is the moment where the British Empire was terminally humiliated. The a, a Egyptian nationalist leader it humiliates the British Empire and drives them out. And yet now, and this amazes me, there is a branch of a, of a British public school, Malvern College, you know, one of the training grounds of the elite of empire, the kind of place that used to train up military officers and colonial administrators and so on. There is a branch of Malvern College in Egypt, which opened to educate the the children of Egyptian oligarchs. And it went out and and at the opening ceremony, Tony Blair did a speech at the opening ceremony to say, you know, how delighted he was that, you know, British values were were arriving in, in Egypt. And say, well, what kind of values are we talking about here? 
you know, what are these schools actually teaching the children of oligarchs? And I find that absolutely fascinating. This, as you say, this this soft power, this prestige of what Britain can offer you if you're rich enough, is is spreading all around the world. I mean, there are now branches of private schools in in Kazakhstan. Uh, the branches in 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 Bangkok, in China, a Butler Training Institute, another extraordinary thing, the the export trade in British butlers, um, which is an amazing thing that I never knew existed. Yeah, you know, there are Butler training schools all over the world, so that you know you too can have a butler as if you were in Remains of the Day, or or um or or you know Jeeves and Worcester. It's it's a really extraordinary phenomenon how this yes, yeah, as you say, this sort of soft prestige of British culture and British skills has been sort of repurposed to be a, um, you know, a, a, a sort of adjunct to the, to the British sort of financial offering. And it's just fascinating that the, the sort of the, um, the, the last legacy of empire, this, um, this reputation of this sort of Hugh Grant style, like manners and, and, and sort of bumbling politeness and the cultural cachet of some of Britain's elite institutions that's become like one of Britain's last marketable things, and it's being used to the service of, of you know, some of some of the worst international practices in terms of policy. The undoing, you know, seventy or so years of this, when it reaches so far, it has, you know, the there are the hard financial elements of it, and and the much softer things that we were talking about too. Where would you begin if you suddenly had a seat, you know? In, in number 10 advising Boris Johnson and the government were serious about beginning to unravel some of this, where would you begin with it? I mean, I I would begin with some of these policies the government has announced in the last week, incredibly. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, transparency of ownership of offshore property, proper cleanup of our mess of a corporate registry. But then to go much, much further, we have an incredibly incoherent anti-money laundering regulatory system in it makes no sense. We need to properly resource the fight against all these things. And as you say, this is embedded decades long embeddedness into our institutions, into our culture. It is going to take time. But as a lesson which I learned from a, a friend of mine, someone I'm very proud to call my friend, Daria Kalinyuk, who's currently in Kiev. She is one of Ukraine's bravest anti-corruption activists, a, you know, a tireless battler for the right thing. And I once asked her how she didn't lose hope considering how hard it was to transform Ukraine, you know, and battle back against the oligarchs. And she said, well, she doesn't ever think about, you know, getting to 100% good. She just said, well, we're at 4% now. But if I can get to 5% next year, that will be a victory. So this mm-hmm. is going to be a, a battle for, for the long haul. And I'm really heartened by the fact that the government has promised to do things that, you know, people like Daria, anti-corruption activists have, have asked the UK to do for ages. That's good. But that will only get us to 5%. You know, we need to then go to 6%, which is to have proper resourcing of our law enforcement and keep the pressure on. And that means we need to keep hearing from people like Daria and activists from all over the world, people in, in South America and, and other develop, developing nations that are being looted with British uh, complicity. We need to hear from them all the time to understand the costs that our policies are having. You know, that's what I'm going to keep doing. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm delighted that to, I've seen lots of wonderful stuff in the New Statesman over the years. I'm sure the New Statesman will keep doing this. And, and I really hope other other journalists will, you know, will, will, will carry on too, because we have to keep representing these voices, you know, in, to, to Britain to make sure British people can't just look away and say they didn't know this was happening. Oliver, it's been great to have you on the New Statesman podcast. Um, and Oliver's book, Butler to the World, How Britain Became the Servant of Tycoons, Tax Dodgers, Kleptocrats and Criminals is out in March. And I thoroughly recommend it. Thank you.